Welcome to Medical Matters Weekly with Dr. Trey Dobson, presented by Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and Catamount Access Television. Welcome, everybody. Today is March 23rd, 2022. I think well into spring, or at least it feels like it outside yesterday and today. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly. It's a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. And my guest today is Tracy Dolan. She is the director of the Vermont Refugee Office. Thank you so much for joining us, Tracy. Thanks. I'm happy to be here, Trey. I actually stumbled over that. Vermont's Refugee Office. So what's your exact title? I'm the director of the state refugee office. So Vermont's Refugee Office is fine. That's great. Okay. And just a little bit, and we're going to delve into that, which is um, why Tracy is here. A little bit about her background. She earned a bachelor's in public health education and promotion from, now I'm not going to pronounce this right, Dalhouse. Dalhousie in Halifax, Nova Scotia. That was close, Dalhousie, okay. And then a master's in community health and preventative medicine from the University of Northern British Columbia. Um, Got her start, and I wanna talk a little bit about this uh, upcoming, in Northern Canada, working with vulnerable populations and reducing the risk of HIV transmission and infection. Um, Spent 10 years working in international health, uh, primarily in according to my notes here, sub-Saharan Africa with a focus on HIV and AIDS care and prevention, maternal child health, and youth reproductive health. Um, Gosh, you've done quite a bit, Tracy. It's been a good life. Other locations. Yeah, that's great. And other locations. So we'll tie all that in. Um, And then you also, you know, most recently in the way that many of us, including myself, have gotten to know Tracy, is she served as Vermont's Deputy Commissioner of Public Health for 10 years, Uh, And most recently, throughout all the COVID uh, pandemic response initiatives, that's where you heard her, where you saw her, and you read about her uh, most recently. So I'll just start by asking this background questions, Tracy. So tell us a little bit about, you know, where you're from and where you grew up and eventually how you ended up here. Sure, yeah. I was actually born in Newfoundland, so um, I'm on the right side of the country now. Uh, Yeah, I was born in Newfoundland, and I was there until I was in elementary school. And I came from a big family, a big Catholic family of six kids. And so we all got on the plane and moved to British Columbia when uh, my father was working for um, a pulp and paper company in Newfoundland and it closed down. And so we were all shifted over to British Columbia where he found work there. And so Prince Rupert, British Columbia, a small fishing town on the Northwest coast, grew up there. Uh, with um, with my brothers and sisters and my parents, uh, a rainy town, the rainiest place that's inhabited in North America, to be more clear. Wow. Yes, wow. very rainy, uh, but, but a great town. And then eventually uh, went on and went to school for years and years and years because I liked going to school. So I went to um, University of British Columbia for a few years. I went overseas to um, Japan for a couple of years after that worked um, teaching English there, worked for Radio Japan for a couple of years. I thought I wanted to be a broadcast journalist, so that was part of it. And then traveled a little, came back uh, to Canada, saw some things when I was traveling that inspired my desire to actually go into international work and public health. I thought I wanted to go to medical school, and when I traveled, I, I sort of got a different sense of where I wanted my efforts to go. Um, I did uh, an, an, another undergraduate degree in health education and eventually ended up doing graduate work up in northern British Columbia, um, primarily working with our indigenous population. In British Columbia, we call it First Nations. And so working with First Nations mm-hmm. communities around HIV, AIDS, um, prevention, sexual uh, reproductive health, those kinds of issues, worked with street involved youth as well. And then eventually, um, shifted into the international work, went with uh, Save the Children to Malawi in um, Southern Africa. Malawi made famous by Madonna, who I believe adopted children from Malawi. Um, And worked a lot on the HIV pandemic, which was of course still raging at that time. That was in the late nineties, doing a lot of work with communities. The goal being in that work to really work with communities on their own prevention and mitigation, trying to support their own structures to do that. And then uh, worked for Child Fund International for a lot of years, 
traveling all around, uh, based um, in Richmond, Virginia, but working all over the place, um, Uganda, Zambia, Ethiopia, a lot of different parts of Africa. Um, and then I was the uh, public health HIV uh, senior officer for Child Fund International. So I kind of went wherever there was HIV in the world where we had operations. Um, so some work in India, Central and South America. And, uh, and then we also responded to emergencies. So actually shifted to um, some child protection work um, and uh, landed in Afghanistan at one point as well. So all over the place, eventually getting here to Vermont, I, I actually met my, um, I will call him my husband. He is my ex-husband, but we think husband sounds better. So I met him and eventually um, came here to the US, got my green card, my citizenship, and got this lovely job at the health department, eventually uh, promoted into the deputy commissioner there and have had a great life here in Vermont. Well, I mean, I just, I know if the audience is anything like I am, I mean, I just envisioned all of this, starting with you growing up on the coastline, it was a gray, rainy day, and you had a boat and you're trying to get out there and fish uh, to all of the, the travels eventually in, in Japan. And uh, I can't wait to read the book when it comes out. So interesting. Let me just ask a little bit, you know, um, in my medical career, I, I just sort of missed the, um, the HIV. I was in, in training right when the um, when AIDS was, uh, of course, still around, still something we have to be very careful about. But right when I was finishing, our wards were still, the internal medicine wards were still full, uh, at least half to three quarters of HIV patients, AIDS patients, which now it dwindled pretty quickly. But um, I imagine that left a, a remarkable imprint on, on you, um, perhaps more than anything you've done. I don't know. Let me ask you that. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, and as you know, the, um, the HIV epidemic um, really devastated many regions of the world and, mm -hmm. and many family structures. I mean, sub-Saharan Africa particularly was brutally hit by HIV, as were parts of India. Whole classes were hit as well. Um, you know, in India, uh, you know, a lot of people among the, the lower class, um, people who worked in the sex trade, I mean, just, uh, you know, incredibly hit. But in southern um, sub-Saharan Africa, you know, the family structures, there were whole generations where grandparents were raising children. Um, I mean, over and over and over, you would go out to places, see all these little kids and see all of these older people raising them. And, and sometimes, you know, up to 30 or 40 percent of the middle uh, section uh, who should have been parents were dead. Uh, it was brutal. And so uh, it was this large orphan crisis and, of course, health crisis. Um, it impacted every aspect. I remember being in Malawi and... Um, and finding out, you know, the the uh, the lifespan had been going up at that point in all over Africa and in ma many developing countries, and particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, you saw almost a ten-year drop in lifespan among men um, pretty quickly uh, due to due to the HIV epidemic. And now, of course, a lot of things that have happened um, around the UN goals, around erad eradication of poverty, around hunger, malaria, other things have shifted those numbers back to a better place, but, but it did have a huge impact and it's uh, devastating. And, and one thing that I've learned and relearned and relearned is that the idea that we attach any kind of morality to, to public health and behavior and what makes things happen is, is laughable because uh, you know, that's not how disease operates. They don't care what, you're, what you think is right or wrong. There's simply a situation and we need to address it. And, and, and throwing uh, morality or judgment into the mix when you see whole populations being devastated is just not helpful. And I know morality was heavily tied to HIV here in the US for a long time and, and just seeing how unhelpful that is when you're trying to battle something. Absolutely, you know, and um, we have to keep talking about it, Tracy, even during uh, COVID, uh, we have to keep talking about for awareness. And actually we check ourselves, right? We check to make sure that what we're doing and everything is, is uh, recognizing, yes, there are certain 
behaviors or certain populations are going to be at, at higher risk for illness. And why is that? And let's address those issues, not the judgmental. And I'm so happy you brought that up. You know, back to Africa and some of your experiences there, you were talking about lifespans. I imagine that the lifespans were, were rising prior to um, AIDS, uh, secondary to better treatment for malaria, uh, polio eradication, and, and then also just supportive um, clean water, for yes. example. And then AIDS uh, just shot that back so much. Yeah. We're not seeing quite that effect of COVID in Africa, at least what I'm reading, but it's also early in, the, um, in this infectious disease entity of, of COVID-19. Do you keep up with Africa as far as infectious disease? You know, I do a little bit. Mm-hmm. I am, I'm pretty close to Dr. Chen, who was uh, our former health commissioner, and his wife has done uh, work more recently in Uganda. And so, and he actually went over a few years ago and helped set up the first emergency medical school in Uganda, the first emergency medical uh, physicians uh, training program. And so through him, I sort of have been a little more interested in what's going on in Uganda, and I live there a little bit. So I did start to see when it was starting to pick up there, but it has been interesting. I don't know if they're just going to get a miss on this in terms of the broad impact. I don't know if the health infrastructure is so weak that maybe we're not getting accurate reports or if there's just a lag. I mean, two years feels like a forever to us here, but there are some waves of illness that occur or um, epidemics or infections or new diseases that occur in one area that might take years to really show up in another. So I'm not certain what's happening there. Um, wow, we are all learning so much about, about infection and, and, and all of this through this because a lot of things that we thought we knew, uh, you know, uh, we're learning new things. No, absolutely. You're right. I mean, when I was reading most recently, I think it was even within the past week about uh, some of the death rates in Africa being less than other parts of the world. I want to believe that, right? I have that hopeful, but that's a bias. And the truth of the matter is it's too early to know whether that's a real effect or a reporting effect, like you said, uh, or or just a pattern of infectious disease taking hold and and the way it's going to present itself. So, so back to, let's talk about COVID-19 real quick, and then we'll be done with it. Um, you, you know, you served in this position for the past two years. You were really out there in front of the public, uh, helping explain things. And again, thank you for everything you and your colleagues have done. Uh, thank you from Southern Vermont, but thank you from all of, of healthcare. Tell us a little bit about that experience. I mean, you could talk for hours, right? You probably don't want to, but just tell us some memorable things you can come up with uh, over the past two years. I think the first thing that I have to share is that when you thank me, I'm go- I am passing that on in my mind immediately to the staff at the Department of Health uh, because I was out front, but I was the least of the effort that went into this. I mean, for every hour I put in, there were people putting in one and a half to two hours for every my every hour. I mean, it, it was a phenomenal uh, workload. But speaking of things that we didn't expect, normally when we have a public health emergency, we stand up a health operations center. And really, most big public health emergencies like this, we plan, you know, maybe four months max, you know, they kind of have a, they kind of have a a natural progression. And none of us thought we'd be standing this up for this long. So I think the shock just to the workforce, and then of course, the impact on Vermonters in those early days, I would say one of the hardest things was seeing this um, spread through the, um, the nursing homes, uh, the, the the homes for for the elderly, um, and uh, I'm not I'm not getting the phrase right, but um, and and seeing it move through, uh, watching people get sick, not having a vaccine yet, not having a cure, of course, and knowing that we were going to see people die from this, and not being able to do a whole lot about it. We got out ahead. We we worked to um, increase any kind of infection prevention we could. Vermont was actually number one in our ability to try to get in early. But even then, uh, that was brutal. And so the impact on our elderly, I know it hit everybody, but I have to say the impact on our elderly around isolation, um, dying alone, uh, and then and then all of the and then our staff that were working with those nursing homes. Um, and, and working with the staff there at two o'clock in the morning um, and, and having our public health people and the nurses talk and the sense of helplessness. I just, 
that is, uh, you know, that that just can't be forgotten, the impact that that has on people to do all of that work, to be so close and to sometimes feel helpless. So I feel like we've come so far in that we have vaccines that can help us, especially with hospitalization, preventing hospitalization and death. Um, but it was an incredible experience, worked with incredible people. People had to step up in uh, in every area, including in healthcare, and go beyond what they thought they had ever would do learning new skills and having to be so incredibly flexible. You know, working in uh, developing countries, I'm used to the idea that, uh, you know, we might work with almost nothing at times. We are not used to that here. So to actually have to work with serious resource shortages, not only people, but equipment and information and medicine, uh, that that's new, it was hard. Um, and, and Vermont uh, stepped up and was amazing across the board, all the way from communities, kids, teachers, healthcare. I mean, so much kudos to healthcare, public health staff, companies, businesses. I mean, just everyone. It, it's been an incredible experience, and, and I'm so honored to have been a part of it uh, through last year. You know, you talk about these congregate li living situations like the skilled nursing facilities and the assisted living. and it almost, you know, in, in watching the people, watching people die, um, it, that probably is quite similar to some of the HIV and AIDS work uh, that you were doing. But you, you just remind me of something, you know, even during that part, just a year and a half ago, it was, there's a lot of judgment, unintentional place. So a, an outbreak would occur. And it was, you know, pretty quickly because of what did they do wrong? What did they do? And it took us a while to understand you can do everything right. You can follow the books. You can, and it's no one's fault, uh, but the infectious disease, it's going to win out. We have to keep working on the prevention and treatment, you know, not uh, some, you know, complete um, avoidance because we can't avoid infectious disease. If we could avoid it, then it wouldn't be a pandemic, right? That's the whole aspect. So let's talk some about your, your work now, because it's exciting. It's different. I guess my first question is, how did you make that leap? Yeah, it's, it has been really exciting. Yeah, no, and I did love my previous job. But coming into this, I mean, there was an opportunity. When you work in state government, when you work as a governor appointee, you know, at some point, you're probably going to have to shift out because governors shift out. And, and, uh, you know, eventually, you probably have to make that change. So it's nice to get out ahead of it and make the change into a place that you would, you'd like to go. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. people in these types of appointed positions, if the governor changes and their position has to change, they kind of look and see what's available and, and take what's available at times. And sometimes they leave state government. I really like working for the state of Vermont. It's been great for me. So to see this position open up, to know that there was a lot of interest in it, to know that we had a governor who was particularly interested in it, not that I'm saying former governors haven't been, but this governor um, early on, well before the Afghanistan situation, was really vocal about having a pretty strong interest in refugees and also really vocal through the COVID response, too, about a really strong interest in equity uh, in the state overall and, uh, and those kinds of issues. So uh, I thought it was a really good opportunity. So we had a great um, uh, state refugee director, Delise uh, Lamoureux who was in this position for about 20 years. And so I knew I was stepping into something that was strong. Um, and, and then of mm -hmm. course, within a couple of weeks, the Afghanistan situation happens. And so it was, uh, it has been, and it continues to be a lot of learning. Uh, and it's been great. It's been intense, not in the same way of the pandemic, probably a little more positive, um, but it, it's been intense and, and great. Let me ask some just really obvious questions that uh, may or may not be able to answer almost cliche, like how many um, Afghan rev refugees have we seen in Vermont and do we anticipate more? Yes, we have right now about 240, I think. Mm -hmm. And we anticipate that we will likely see, we're, we're ready to take up to about 130 more. Um, not sure if we will get all of those. So we had phase one. So they started arriving in kind of October, November. They kept coming all the way through mid-February. And now we're likely going to see phase two start sometime in April through June. So we will see another uh, wave of um, Afghan arrivals coming in. And so far, it's been it's been very good. And for the audience, just to know, um, I'm sure all hospitals have participated in healthcare systems and trying to provide some health care for these individuals. I know we were uh, contacted and 
uh, able to uh, get some primary care and uh, follow-up care for these individuals. And also, Tracy, I mean, I don't know where I heard this. I read something that there are groups of Afghans still waiting in Washington, D.C. to be relocated. Is that this phase two that you're talking about? Yeah, they, uh, there were Afghans waiting. So there were um, kind of military bases where folks were and that that's where they were getting released from. They closed all of them down. Maybe they have one that's open, but, but there shouldn't be many in that situation. Now where we've got people coming from is people who are waiting in other countries to come into the U.S., um, mm -hmm. Qatar as an example. And so they'll be coming in, making their first stop somewhere, probably in a central military a base or some central welcome area, and then being sent to communities. And so now we'll have those folks coming in as phase two. Okay, that's great. Tell me, um, I, let's focus a little bit just on the healthcare aspect, because I know you're yes. in charge of, of all aspects, but what do you see these refugees needing? And I'm sure it varies from what part of the world they're coming from. It does. And, you know, I just want to shout out that up until this year, most of our refugees were coming in through the Chittenden County area. So the UVM system did a lot of support for them. And what has happened this year very quickly is that all kinds of other hospitals and primary care providers all around the state, because Afghans are going to a lot of different places, have had to stand up and they have just been exceptional with very little orientation or training or support. You know, they've suddenly had to figure it out. The kinds of things we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing some gastrointestinal issues with folks coming in. Uh, a lot of that could be stress induced. It could be also change in diet and situation. Um, we are seeing, uh, we know through our lead program, we're seeing elevated lead programs and kids, uh, lead programs, sorry, lead levels and kids, some lead poisoning there. That's probably likely related to cookware that was used back in Afghanistan. Also possibly related to some cultural practices like the use of um, uh, a particular type of eyeliner that is uh, given to uh, small children culturally that, that may have some lead in it as well. And then we're seeing a lot of dental issues. A lot of folks come not just from Afghanistan, mm -hmm. but from a lot of countries where we receive refugees that certainly didn't have any regular dental care. So those needs are here. Um, and then all the other needs that you would have probably in any um, uh, you know, population. Some of these folks probably never had any kind of regular medical care unless they were very sick, whereas some of them may have had regular medical care because they may have been more middle class. Right, right. Yeah, it's funny from an emergency medicine standpoint, you know, we, we study uh, diseases that are international. And that's the first thing I think about are these, you know, more rare sister psychosis and, and uh, leishmiasis and all these things that, you know, we screen for, I do know they screen for them right when they come in, because we've done some of that screening. Uh, but then after that, it's the same health concerns we all have, um, really, like you said, uh, related to uh, whether what your education level is typically and, and what your economic level is. Uh, and I'm glad that Southern Vermont has been participating. I mean, I think the whole whole state has been participating. It's great. I know the next question from the audience is going to be, uh, what about Ukraine? Are we going to be seeing any refugees from Ukraine? And I'm sure you don't have a crystal ball there, but what are you seeing uh, so far? So up until today, the message we had been getting was, and I think this is still primarily the message, the goal is, and as you know, millions leaving uh, Ukraine right now. I keep saying the Ukraine because old school, that's how we learned it, but it's actually Ukraine. The okay. Ukraine is associated with, uh, with uh, the Soviet Union and Russia, so it's Ukraine. So we are seeing people, uh, millions leave Ukraine. The goal is to keep them in the EU area, European Union area. They have, um, of course, the ability to move uh, as part of the European Union union when they're there um, freely uh, with the goal of course that they get resettled back into Ukraine uh, when peace is found but there are millions and millions and there's a lot of pressure here in the U.S. especially with people who have Ukraine families here who have members over there to try to bring them in um, generally we're still hearing that there's probably not going to be a mass refugee resettlement refugee resettlement usually takes years and years Afghanistan was an mm -hmm. exception because the US airlifted a lot of people out. They felt a very strong moral obligation because so many were helping the military. In the case of Ukraine, we may still have some exceptions here. Obviously, 
Uh, the geopolitical implications of this war are tremendous. Obviously, the scope is huge with that many people leaving. But what we're starting to hear now is that maybe there will be an opportunity if there are families here that they may be able to bring in family members as refugees. We have received no formal guidance. So right now, we're not really preparing and we haven't been told to prepare. But normally the way refugee resettlement works is that the State Department actually assigns refugee families to refugee settlement agencies um, across the country, and that's how it works. So it doesn't really happen one-on-one -on -one in that way. Uh, so we'll see what happens. We know it, it could come. We're not sure how big the numbers will be. We know the goal generally is to help where they are in that area in Europe and not necessarily to bring them all the way over. Right. Well, they want to be home when they can, I assume. Yeah. And um, thank you for updating us on that. I mean, it's questions that I have as well. And I really don't know a resource to go read that information that you just told in about two minutes. So thank you so much. Um, we have to mention your experience as a comedian just to shift gears here. So <laughs> just tell me, I mean, is your favorite show The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel or no? Oh, you know, I like that show. I like season one the best. My favorite parts of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is when she's actually on stage. Because I'm a comedian, so I'm curious about her process, you know. Mm. But um, but I don't know that that's my favorite. Uh, but no, c comedy has was great during the pandemic as a release, even if it was through Zoom. Um, it's been really exciting to see people actually be able to get on a stage again since um, we're not post-pandemic, but since we've had some relaxing of the rules and since so many people were vaccinated, of course, Got to shout out the Vermont Comedy Club has done an amazing job of ensuring that they uh, they have audiences that are vaccinated and masked. Um, but yeah, it's it's a nice release. It's a wonderful comedy community here. And um, if anyone ever wants to try it out, they should look into taking a class or come out to an open mic. It's a it's you know, all parts of your health are important, including um, your social and mental health. And sometimes laughing helps. Is that what you did? Did you take a, a class or uh, how did you get into it? Well, I didn't actually, but a lot of people do. I actually taught a class, and so my class just finished a few weeks ago. But I actually got into it. Um, a colleague in in, in uh, state government had gone to a few open mics years ago and said, why don't you come out and check one out? So I came out, and I listened, and I thought, oh, maybe I could do that. And so I went back the next week. This was you know, probably seven or eight years ago. And that's how I got into it. Just started going to some open mics and you get up and you tell a funny story that you've told at parties that you've noticed that people laugh about and then you build from there. Now oh, that's so awesome. Does it affect your, or how does it affect your healthcare work or, or does it probably indirectly, but how do you tie those together? Yeah, well, you know, right now I don't do healthcare work. So I'm the, I'm the refugee director, but yeah. I will say, how does it affect my work? Um, I've always kind of joked around a little bit at work, so that that's that remains. Um, I, I think it just gives me an outlet so that if something is hard, um, you know, I don't talk about the specifics of work on stage, but I might be able to work through something by changing some of the details or changing the context. Um, and it's a fun way to connect with people. I've had people when I was deputy commissioner, um, you know, it can be a little hierarchical, but then if they see you at the comedy club, then they feel a connection to you. And so that's, that's also nice. And I think, um, I think bringing humor into the workplace is almost always helpful. I'm, I'm hoping, you know, with the refugee program, I've talked to the comedy club, they would love to figure out how to do some workshops for new Vermonters who want to, you know, get into a little comedy. So uh, I think anything to uh, lighten up the time that we have on this planet is time well spent. That's awesome. I mean, humor definitely improves familiarity, as you mentioned, among individuals and, and familiarity is, is what breeds trust, right? And so that's really, I think, important in the workforce. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tracy. It's just been awesome. Thank you. It was really great to talk to you. All right. Um, so uh, let's see here. Thanks, everyone, for coming and, and uh, viewing or, or participating with Medical Matters Weekly. I'll, I'll also thank Mike Cutler of Cat TV, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity. And we will see you next week. <laughs>